the heart of Wellington, Kansas, Powder and String Outfitters is your down-home, one-stop shop for all things shooting sports and outdoors. Welcome to the Powder and String Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Powder and String Outfitters podcast. I am super excited today. I've got a really close friend of mine, um, Miles Miller. He is, uh, um, you want to talk about hunting and fishing, anything outdoors. Um, He's the outdoorsman galore. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Miles is a super, super good guy, extremely humble, Um, but... uh, you know, you've had a hunting and guiding business. You've you've kind of done it all, but um, maybe to start off, you want to just give our listeners out there a little bit of your background and why you like the outdoors. Well, I started out um, eight years old. Um, the, the Boy Scouts in Wellington used to have a trap shoot for a fundraiser long, long ago. Um, my dad would take me out there when I was Started when I was seven and got serious about it when I was eight. So, um, started shooting clay targets and that quickly, I mean, that turned into a unbelievable passion of mine and we started shooting competitively. Um, never to that point, I'd never hunted. Um, and, but I shot clay targets competitively. We, you know, started in state events and that quickly turned into, national events and all over the country we'd travel three four months out of the year on the road um shooting and uh a friend of my dad's was uh real big into hunting and uh got me uh started duck hunting so uh 11 12 years old you were hooked from there Uh, the first time i went it was unbelievable uh got to go on the youth season so yeah. Uh, you know, that, that was an extra weekend that he could, he could go hunt, take his dog out. And, uh, you know, the first time I ever went just, I mean, immediately fell in love with it. So, uh, and the rest is history. So oh, to say. yep. Several hundred thousand dollars later, we're, we're still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for those of you out there that have been into waterfowl hunting, um, or hunting of any kind, <laughs> he's not exaggerating. Uh, you know, it just, uh, nickel and dime here and mm-hmm. it can go quickly. Um, I, mean, I guess I should, you know, full disclosure, I should say, hence the reason for powder and string outfitters. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My, my wife always jokes around. She comes into the shop and she's like, you know, I feel like this is like your, you know, you've got all these shoes and handbags in here that you get to touch and play with every day. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, oh, that's, these, mm-hmm. th- these are all for sale. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I'm sorry, go ahead. So duck hunting and started in duck hunting that went to Turkey and pheasant, quail, deer, pretty much hunted everything mm-hmm. uh, all through middle school, high school. I would leave on the weekends. Uh, we went out Western Kansas, uh, Pratt, Greensburg area. We had, a lease out there and I'd spend every, I mean, every weekend out there from mid September till the end of January hunting something. And, uh, so after that, um, you know, eventually you got to have a real job. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and along the way, start, uh, I always, I grew up playing golf. So, yeah. um, really competitive in golf, uh, played division one college golf. Yeah. Um, but you know, kids, family. So I got to ask this question, and and I, I don't remember if I've asked you this before or not. So, um, a, a little bit more background between Miles and I. Um, our family, so our our dads and our grandparents were friends mm-hmm. back in the day. But there's a I don't know what is there, at least fifteen year difference, maybe pushing twenty year difference, yeah, I, age difference. We don't. Us. We, we'd probably it doesn't look- matter. <laughs> Right. That's neither here nor there. My, uh, I'm not 30 yet. Right. So. Well, and Dylan's always trying to get me to give my age and I'm not telling you, Dylan. 62. Yeah. Not happening. <laughs> Sorry. One of these days he's going to guess right. And it's going to be like all these flashing lights, like the price is right. Yep. Ding, 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 winner. Come on down. Showcase, showcase showdown. Um, but anyway, so, um, I kind of, well, you know, I left, went to college, you know, 
started my life, if you will. And I knew who you were just because of, you know, family and stuff like that. Small, smaller town. So everybody knows, but, um, so <clears throat> I was told that you, I think you were on the Wichita state uh-huh. golf club yep. or golf team, excuse me. Uh-huh. And is it true that you told them like, Hey, give this scholarship to somebody else. I'd, I'm going to go hunting and fishing. I, I, pretty much. That was it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. And, and honestly, that's why. I I like Miles is the most honest guy. Like you'll, you know, well, well, here what a month ago we were out shooting coyotes. Mm, yeah, a little over a month ago. And you, uh, what was it you said? Oh, that's when I I found out that you you were talking about you took the whole second semester of school off and you went shooting mm-hmm. and yep. playing golf. Yep. And I I mean I of course like I said I'm we're family our families are friends and everything but but I had no idea and. I mean, we've been friends and for 10 years better and i never had heard that. Yep. But, so. yep. And starting in third or fourth grade, my, my mom and dad would take me out of school at Christmas break. Uh, we would go to Florida, uh, shoot competitively, play golf competitively for all of January, February and March. And I would get back and back in school by spring break. So it was, I mean, it was an awesome experience. It was that's uh, I mean, memories that, uh, memories were made and met so many great people and uh it, it was an unbelievable experience i could i can only imagine that's that's totally cool and and it's you know just you, you know, it's yeah i mean to think back and, and to, to you know play that out in, in my mind when you told me that i was like man that's just as awesome as it can be you know oh, just, it was it was great of course you know at that age you you'd think well that's the way life is but so were you a snot-nosed little brat no and, no. no, 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 no. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine your dad letting that happen. No, no. And you know, what was really good was I spent all my time at, from, you know, about 10 years old with adults. Uh, there wasn't hardly any, there was nobody my age in the shooting sports. Um, there was some kids that were, you know, 15 to 18 years old, but 10, 11, 12 years old, I was, I was the only one that was remotely close to that age. So all my time was spent with adults, you know, mm-hmm. uh, practice during the week, you know, which most of them were uh, retirement age guys uh, that didn't, you know, that was their hobby. So, you know, I just grew up with, with adults. So, yeah. So again, you, you went shooting and you're not, you're not coming full, full, fully clean with your, with your <laughs> ability to shoot and, what you were shooting and, and, you know, your sponsor, how many rounds were you shooting and stuff? When I was really diehard, I was shooting about 60,000 rounds a year. Man, that's just an enormous amount of rounds. It it was a lot. And I, you know, I'd go to an orthopedic surgeon twice a year, have an MRI, make sure my growth plates and my shoulder weren't being damaged. Uh, yeah, I never would have thought of that, but yep. yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that recommendation come from a, another, a guy that I met that was, that we shot with and it's what he did was an orthopedic surgeon. And that was mm-hmm. a huge concern of his. And he said, Hey, you need to do this. So, um, and no, ever, nothing, nothing was ever pr- wrong. So, um, I mean, there's a, I would tell you that if you took, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, and this is just off the top of my head, but most hunters, most outdoorsmen probably won't shoot 60,000 rounds in their entire life. Probably not. 60,000 rounds is a lot. I, I mean, I consider myself a pretty diehard waterfowl hunter, and I shoot three or 400 rounds a year. Well, yeah, but I already know you, you don't miss. So you're not, not you're not, not very many. You're, you're <laughs> not, you're not the typical diehard, um, waterfowl hunter where, you know, it's, you know, you have three shots and all three of them were taken. <laughs> if, if you do, there's at least three birds on the yeah, water. I, I don't let too many of them get away. I, this will be an uncomfortable question for you because I know your personality. How how many times did you miss a bird last year? Oh. Well, if any of my friends see this, I didn't miss at all. So. <laughs> Fair <laughs> no, enough. No. And I, you got, I, and you got all that last. Yeah, all everybody shot at the same well, time. That was, I brought that one down. Well, that's our that's our running group, and the the guys I hunt with yeah. is you know when we all stand up and shoot and. 
there's 10 of them dead on the water and everybody goes, I didn't hit anything. I didn't hit anything. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to clean them. So, right. And at the end of the day, nope, I didn't hit anything. And any of us that have been out hunting I, this last hunting season, I went out, I'm not going to say any names. And there were guys that I hadn't hunted with before. They were, they were from out of state and, um, there was that guy in the group that, yeah. Oh, that one was mine. It's like, <laughs> I just, I don't know. There's just, yeah. Yeah. You know, anyway, we we can move along from that. Yep. But so I know you were running a number in your head, but you know, like, how many birds do you legitimately think you you missed last year? Um, there was a, every hunt I had one that I would, you know, that I I would miss. I'd miss one or two. I think he's lying. I already know that's not true. <laughs> So no, when when I was shooting and shootings like anything, the the less you do it, I mean, you know, you, if you, the more you shoot, the better you're going to be, and you do you do lose some of the edge. And shooting targets, going to live birds, it's it's totally different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, is it totally different but completely the same? Yes. I mean, because I've yeah. shot I've shot clay pigeons. Yep. I've I've hunted my whole life, shot clay pigeons, you know, off and on my whole life, and it's I see what you're saying, but. You know what, what most people do, you know, and my time guiding as a waterfowl guide, every, what I notice is most people shoot before they're ready. They think, okay, well, these birds, they're going to, you know, when you call the shot, they, you, we got to shoot right now. They're going to get out of here. Most people shoot before they're ready, shoot before their guns shouldered. Um, you don't know. get it positioned correctly. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's, you know, that's a huge deal. And that's probably where I do better than than most, but everybody I hunt with is because, you know, I do usually let them shoot first and that's awful. Nice and, of you. Well, you know, I like the longer shot. Um, but I, I do, I mean, that's, it's subconsciously, I make that decision to wait mm -hmm. just, just a split second. You know, we're, we're not talking five seconds. We're talking just long enough to make sure you're ready to shoot. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when you, um, when you're, I guess one question I, I've, I've always thought about with regards to, to clay pigeon shooting and the competitive side of that, I know that it's not just the same, you know, set up every single time, no. but with clay pigeons, is there a, is there a repetitive motion, if you will, or a, consi a, a consistency to them? Yeah, because, you know, those machines, they can only throw the target one, you know, they're going to, they only can throw it one way or another. They can tilt them and angle them and, you know, up, down, mm -hmm. but the the flight's very consistent unless they're going into the wind. Um, into the wind, they're like a frisbee. You know, they'll out of nowhere they'll just go rise. Straight. Yeah, they'll rise. Drop. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's usually pretty consistent. And um, you know, I shot sporting clays, which was um, usually twelve, fourteen stations. Mm -hmm. um, usually shoot a hundred targets. And for our listeners out there who don't know what sporting clays, the difference between sporting clays and and shooting trap, so to you know, clay mm -hmm. pigeons. They're both done with with the the clay pigeon, if right. you will. But the right. trap shooting is you're standing all right. You got five, trap shooting. You got five guys in a line. There's one you know one target thrower that all you know. It's it's very repetitive. Um, sporting clays. The courses you go. The the terrain's always different. There, I, I would compare it to a golf course. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, the terrain's different. The course is different, and every event they they move the target throwers around, and they have different presentations at every station, you know. And it's designed to simulate a hunting scenario, um, but it's it, sporting clays was where I, what I enjoyed. I started shooting trap, but it got boring, you know. Uh, a, tr a good trap shooter will shoot three ninety nine out of four hundred. Um, good sporting clay shooters will shoot you know, 90, 90 to 95 out of a hundred targets. Man. I mean, I, I've done sporting clays before and I'm not going to say that with a shotgun, I consider myself, I consider myself an above average shot. And I think I kind of, kind of came about that naturally. I was, um, you know, I've talked about it before on the podcast. I started, you know, walking in the field with no gun and then, you know, pheasant and quail mm -hmm. hunting that, and, and, Back then, around these areas, it was we had a lot more birds. Oh yeah, we still got birds here, but it's I mean there was a no, ton, nothing. A ton, like yeah, it was a ton. And then you know I got a little bit older, and then I could carry a BB gun. And obviously, you weren't 
going to shoot anything. I tried. I'm sure I got every one of my shot. I, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I was probably that kid, you know, <laughs> yep. I shot that one. But, um, no, but then you know, I started with the BB gun and then we went, you know, then I got old enough to where I could actually, um, you know, carry a shotgun. But I was always going with, um, guys that were five to seven years older than me. Um, it just so happened I had two, two guys that, um, Doug and Roger Miracle are like my brothers. Um, super, super, super good friends, close, close, close friends of mine. Um, but Roger was, Doug was, uh, six years older than me and Roger was, uh, eight years older than me. And they didn't cut me any slack, nothing, you know. So here I am hunting with guys that are, you know, 20, 22 years old and I'm 14, you know, mm-hmm. trying to, you know, trying to shoot. And I actually have a vivid, vivid memory one time we were pheasant and quant. I can take you right to the field. I know exactly where it was at. And I saw this rooster and he was running. And I, before he had even taken off, I started to raise my gun and took this, you know, taking the safety off and he, you know, busted and I didn't get a shot off. Roger, <laughs> Roger dropped him. Yep. I'm like, and just, I mean, you know, it was deflating, but it was a great way to learn. So mm-hmm. anyway, I consider myself a, a, a decent above average shot. And that's, those numbers are crazy. Yep. And but, the, the, you know, and since I've quit doing it, the, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, he shot in the Tokyo Olympics and I would probably say, it, he right now he's probably the best shooter in the world mm-hmm. um you know for everything sporting clays live pigeons all of it um and at one time i would say his dad was probably a few four or five years ago his dad was probably better and mm-hmm. that's a family that i grew up you know traveling all what's over his name with. uh derek mine Derek so Mine. um his younger brother's a, a really good friend of mine comes out and hunts fishes with me several times a year um and their, you know, their whole family was, that's, that's what we did. We traveled with him. We went all over the place and he's continued his shooting career and he's been unbelievably successful. That's awesome. That's totally cool. Where's he from originally? Uh, or Walnut, Kansas, which Walnut, is, Kansas. which is over by Pittsburgh. All right. Cool. Such a small world. Mm-hmm. Such a small world. So, so you, you know, it's a clay pigeon trap shooting. How, what, how long did you, did you? stay in that if you will. I co- pretty well quit by the time I was 15 to further my golf career. Spent my, spent all my time doing that. Um, and I, you know, like everybody, every kid, they want to dream of being a pro athlete. So, mm-hmm. uh, I, I thought that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play, I'm going to play professional golf. Uh, by the time I got to high school, into high school, started to get a little burnout and, went to Wichita state and after the 6 a.m. workouts five days a week, the on the road every two, three days, every week, you know, airports and you know, all that in and out. And I just, I had enough. So I told him, I said, I'm going to, you were one year. Yep. I went there one year. I said, I'm done. I'm not playing any more golf. So, uh, I've, when I left there, I'd, uh, I already started my business, so, uh, you know, I was kind of focusing on that, and I had a lot of things going on. Love, love, still wanted to hunt and fish all the time, so golf was the last thing on my mind. So after Wichita State, I went one year to Newman University. Um, my The coach there, uh, my deal with him was I didn't have to go to practice. I didn't have to qualify to make the team. Um, all I had to do was go to the tournaments and I, I didn't practice. I didn't so, do any of it. So for anybody that's out there listening and, and, and I can attest to this, um, I don't know that I've ever even played around the golf with you. I wouldn't, I would be, I don't play golf anymore. I've, I used to play all the time, but I can, I can tell you he's, he's, he's an extremely uh, salty golfer. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't play hardly at all anymore, but, um, but you still would he's one of those guys that you want to just kick in the nuts because (laughs) he's like, Oh, I only played like, you know, six rounds last year. And he did only play six rounds, but he's still going to shoot scratch or better or better. Yeah. If you shoot scratch, you're pissed. Yeah. 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 But I've, I've put in thousands of hours to get to that point. Yeah. And that's, I mean, like we've talked about that on the podcast before is it's not just, it's not just that you don't, there's Mm -hmm. not, there's, 
it's so, so, so minuscule amount of, of instances in life where just naturally something yep. happens. It's hard work. And, and I know, know you well enough to know that you, you know, when you put your mind to something more than likely it's going to happen. Yep. I, uh, when, when I do something, I, I, I do it all the way. Right. So at Newman, you were there for one year, one year there. Um, and then even that part-time golf thing wasn't, <laughs> wasn't enough now, to, now, well, you know, I, I, I'd started my business. So I was, I was ready to, you know, for lack of term, better, you know, lack of better terms. Uh, I wouldn't learn anything in school. School was, I mean, school was awful. I, right. I I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not college material. Right. Um, but it was a good experience. Uh, glad I did it, you know, but, uh, so I, I left Newman. Uh, I think I won most every tournament at Newman. Uh, got to go to, uh, Seattle for the NCAA championships and was in the lead going into the final round and got strep throat and didn't play. Oh, I, I didn't know that. that. Yep. So, um, that was, it was a good experience. That actually surprises me knowing your personality that you even with strep, you must have been really oh, sick. Oh, it was, it was bad. It was Cause awful. I was going to say, I know you well enough to know that you would normally. Uh, yeah. I, if I, if, if, yeah, if I could have got out of bed, I probably would have played, but it was, and it you, was awful. You must have had strep the day before. I have started getting sick the day we got there and then I, I played with it the first day and the second day and then the, the third yeah. day. Yeah. So you basically. You put yourself into where you you were just yeah, were done. Yeah, I was done bed. for. I wasn't. I wasn't. I was not making the final round. So even at even even unhealthy with 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 strep, the first two days you were going in, you were leading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's not surprising to me knowing <laughs> you, but but I did not know that story. Yep, that's a cool story. So I've I've got a lot of experiences at. At my age, so you do. I've, I've done. I've done a lot of stuff. Travel all yeah. over the world. So. Yeah, you 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 do, and that's one of the things that's really cool and intriguing to me is, is as long as we've you know, we've been friends, and and I still hear stuff. And I'm like, well, I didn't know that about you. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty cool to to hear that. That's I, I don't know. It's just that's, I love stories like that. Yeah. Like that's just you hear that kind of stuff. So so after you get done with that. Um, then you, I know that, well, you hadn't, you, you, what's next? Next? Uh, next after that, um, well, starting in high school, uh, the guy that got me started hunting, uh, you know, I'd always fished pond, you know, farm ponds, that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. But he start, introduced me to fishing in lakes, uh, you know, or reservoirs. So, uh, started going with him and another thing I fell in love with and wanted to do it every waking second of the day. Um, so I, that's a common theme with you mm -hmm. as well is if, and I, I think that I guess another reason why I think you and I are, are friends is I'm similar in that manner, you know, like again with powder and strings, you know, I tell everybody yep. and, and then my close friends and family are like, you aren't going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to start this thing. It's going to be three days a week, yep. just me by myself. And here we are talking on a podcast. Mm -hmm. Yep. In that's two years. That's how things, that's how most of my stuff is gone. But I mean, yeah. I, I'm the type, like if I'm going to do something, I want to do it. Yep. And I enjoy doing it. I don't, you know, yeah, if I, I didn't like it, I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. I love, I never would, I would have told you even, gosh, like four months ago. Well, Dylan, you, you were the one that because of you, we're sitting here. It's your fault. But I remember like you said, well, we're, we're going to need to do some content. We're going to need to do some footage and we're going to need to do something. You know, I don't know what we were doing something. And you're like, who's going to do it? And I'm like, well, I don't know. And Dylan's like, you're doing it. <laughs> well, here and, we are. Yeah. And remember the very first <laughs> dude, it was cringy. <laughs> I was so like, I, I could talk to anybody. Uh -huh. I, I'd have no problem talking to anybody, obviously. I've never been, I'm not going to say I've ever been on really any TVs or commercial or anything. Yeah. I know it's not that big of a deal. And we're trying to film something for like, I don't know, something for to put on social media or something. And it was like, I couldn't talk. I could stutter and I was, you know, nervous. My hands yeah. were sweaty. It was just, 
it was it was embarrassing. It was yeah. it was bad. But you know, I was like, here we go. And then as we get going, well, then I'm like, well, we're gonna do it. Let's do it right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's why you and I are sitting here today. Yep. Well, that's awesome. It's uh, I'm proud of you. It's when when you started talking about this a year ago, and I remember the conversation. Hey, I'm going to open a gun shop, but we're going to be open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for six hours a day. And that went out the window real quick. Yeah. So no, I appreciate that. But I started, you know, started fishing, fell in love with it, wanted a new boat. So I thought, Hey, I'm, I'm going to start, you know, I was, I'd already taken all my friends, every, you know, two, three days a week, we'd go fishing and I was already being a guide without getting paid. So mm-hmm. I said, I'm going to start a guide business. So bought a new boat and got all set up and the first year I think I might have done 10 or 15 trips and same sort of deal my my goal was to do 25 trips a year basically to pay for the boat and uh, you know basically fund my hobby so by year three 25 trips turned into over a hundred and yeah you were doing two trips a day I was doing two trips a, last year I was doing two trips a day four or five days a week. Um, during the summer months. So I, I don't even know how many I did last year. Well, but. before that though, you were guiding full-time waterfowl. waterfowl. Yep. So you obviously at, at, and you were having, you know, big success with that too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Did, uh, you know, an, another thing to fund my, fund my hobby, so to speak. Uh, I started helping a friend of mine, uh, when, right when I was done with college and that started out as one or two days a week and then, uh, turned into four or five days a week and then, uh, started doing my own thing for a little while and, um, went and guided full time for almost two seasons, uh, at a hunting lodge out, um, North central Kansas. And, uh, you know, it was a great experience. Uh, but in the, in the clientele that you were working with, there were, way high end extreme um everybody flew in there in a in their private jet mm-hmm. so it was not a, a low end operation by any right. means so it, it was an awesome experience um but through all of this i i'm in the rental property business also so that's mm-hmm. that's really how i make a living and mm-hmm. i you know started that when i was 17 and it has grown and grown and grown um uh, but until this point i you know, I had time to do all of it. And, uh, just recently I decided that I have, it was time to focus on the, on the rental properties and go back to fishing and hunting for fun. So. Yeah. Cause you, you and I had a conversation here just a few months ago and you're like, I, I think, I don't think I'm going to do the, 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 uh, guiding fishing guiding thing. No. And I, I love it. I love every second of it. It's, there's nothing better than, you know, kids or people that have n- never experienced that to, get on the boat and go out there and just catch fish after fish after fish. And, and I can tell you that I've seen it more times and heard it more times than I can count on both hands and feet, um, twice over that this dude can put you on fish. We're both extremely busy Mm -hmm. and you've invited me more. I I think you quit inviting me because I quit (laughs) because I haven't gone. I don't, and it's the stupidest thing in the whole world. I just, we're starting this and I just, I'm, I'm making a point this year that I'm going to go do those things. Yep. And that's, that's where I've starting in January. I said, and you know, I, I didn't get to fish with my friends for the last two years, hardly at all. And mm-hmm. if I did get to go, it was a, a scouting trip to a different lake. I hadn't been to for four or five weeks to, you know, so it was work. Yeah. But yeah, there was basically was not a time that I wasn't fishing fishing for the business you know and that's one thing i've heard you you know we've talked on here already about you know college and you don't know what you want to do when you grow up and all that kind of stuff you know i've heard the the term or the saying you know find a job that you love and you'll Mm -hmm. never have to work a day in your life but i've also heard stories of like what you're talking about um a guy i know started you know loved and he was dang good at it he is dang good at it um cooking smoke you know smoking barbecue meat and then he starts a restaurant, mm-hmm. hates it. He's yep. like, you know, now to get him to try and make you something, it's like, dude, I'll buy the, I'll pay you and I'll buy the food and, you know, get you, yeah, so he doesn't want to. Mm-hmm. So do you, were you getting there? 
Um, I mean, it's kind of a little different deal with hunting you know, and fishing, it, it, but but when you, you def- turn it into you a definitely job, do get burnout. Um, the the two trips a day, I don't know four or five times a week does it gets really really old. And <clears throat> where we live, we don't have a we don't have a lake close by, so I'm I'm driving an hour hour and a half each way. Yeah, it's kind of flat around here. Yeah, yeah. There's there's not much for lakes. Um, right. Uh, so I was, you know, the drive is what probably burnt me out the most. Mm-hmm. You know, if I could go, if we lived on a, a nice lake, you know, where you could have a dock right there and you walk down to, you know, get in your boat, it's in a slip and get in your boat, you go fishing and, and you park it back in the slip and clean your fish and you're done. I'd probably still be doing it, but mm-hmm. there's not enough hours in the day to do it all. And, I, you know, the drive is probably was the worst part of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody think, everybody thinks, oh man, you get to go fishing for a living. That's, that's a blast. Well, your four hour fishing trip is about a nine or 10 hour day for me. Mm -hmm. You know, you get the boat ready, clean the boat, get all the rods rigged up, everything, go catch bait, clean the fish, clean the boat when you're done, make sure everything's working, charge the batteries. You know, it, that, that four hour trip is a full day's work. Yeah. And, and you, you said, you gave me another one here recently. How many lures did you say you went through? Like on average, I, I would buy, I would just buy five hundred at a time. So I would probably go through a thousand a thousand rattle traps that's a year. That's freaking crazy. I that, that's just in, insane. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you got clients and yep, that's, you know that's part of it. And yeah, you get snagged and yep, and a lot of the stuff we'd fish, we you know rock piles and stuff, and uh. I can always get a lure off of a rock pile. What I can't get is when I get wrapped up in other people's line that have gotten hung up on the same, rock, the same pile, rock pile, and that's where you lose all your lures. Is mm-hmm. uh, they'll you can always get them to bounce back off of a rock pile, but getting tied up in in, in other people's line is where you lose them all. Hmm. That's crazy. So when you'd go fishing, how many? Like what? What was a what was a good day? What was a bad day? Well, there's no bad day fishing. Well, ever. I guess that's true. <laughs> I kind of, you know, for four people on the boat, my goal was always 60 to 100, which was pretty normal. And you're fishing for wipers? Wipers, white, white bass, bass. Um, wintertime, cr- a lot of crappie. Um, you know, I did some walleye fishing. That's The numbers aren't near as high on walleye. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, middle of the summer or middle of the winter, 100 was kind of standard in a four-hour trip. So the best we ever did was 297. 297. I mean, your arms would be tired. Yep. Because I love to go down. I mean, I, I will freshwater fish too, n- not to those numbers, but yep. But I love to go down, you know, and get the ocean, go do ocean fishing. Mm-hmm. I love that. You know? I've, I've fished all over the U.S., you know, from, you know, walleye and smallmouth in Canada, you know, the northern lakes, walleye fishing on the Great Lakes, uh, yeah, you recently did that. Yeah, was it two years ago? The twenty twenty one, I believe. No, I'm gonna say, and maybe I'm completely wrong. You and another local guy, a buddy of ours, mm-hmm. just I mean, wasn't on a whim, but kind of on a whim. We fished um, the local tournaments. I'd never fished a tournament in my entire life. We fished the local, the state walleye tournaments, um, and neither one of us had really walleye fished, other than. You know, our lakes right here close. Um, Which these lakes right here close are not walleye lakes. They're no, by no means walleye lakes at all. So I, I would say probably the the best thing that we had going for us is we didn't know what we were doing. We just, you know, took what knowledge we had and said, let's go try this. And we, we did things that the other tournament guys were not doing and uh, we had good success. So. We we fished the five or six local or the state tournaments and finished mm-hmm. high enough to make the national the Cabela's national team championship and uh You didn't know that, Dylan? Yeah. It's it it's a typical mile story. We went <laughs> on my boat. <laughs> yeah. Dylan got a fish once. Yeah. And uh so we did that. Um I don't remember where we finished points wise, eight or ninth out of the out of the state, and I don't know in 50, Kansas. Yeah, fifty or sixty teams. I don't remember what they had. And then you went to the 
We mm-hmm. went to Lake Huron. Yeah. Um, we n- neither one of us, you know, I'd I'd walleye fished in Canada and those fly in, you know, those little lakes where you can see them swimming around under the dock. I mean, right. it, it, they're, yeah. you know, most of those fish have never seen a person. Right. And, you know, they're natural walleye lakes. So you can, you can forget what anything you know about doing that. Yeah. And we went to anybody, literally anybody can catch those. Yes. Yes. Uh, we went to Lake Huron and you talk about overwhelming. Um, we, we were there, we pre-fished. Some of those guys were there for, two weeks prior to we fished pre-fished for three days. Um, and I don't know how many gallons of gas we burnt, but we went from once, you know, we would, we would put in somewhere and we would run 30 or 40 miles and check out a few spots. And we were really overwhelmed. I, I mean, could, I can't we, we had, we had, and you know, the local guys, they're, they're trolling crankbaits with, lead core line and all the re- line counter reels and you know this and that and the other and we're here and you know we, we have no business being being there at this point because we don't know anything about those techniques fishing those mm-hmm. big bodies of water and you could look over the boat and 25 feet of water and you could count the rocks on the bottom i mean it was we don't get clear water like no. that we we fish in five or six feet of water or less most of the year Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're out there in 50, 60, 70 feet and we're marking fish on the graph and go, what are those walleye? What are those? Or, you know, are those salmon? Are they walleye? Well, well you know, we have no idea what they are. And mm-hmm. so, uh, we, we're, we're talking about it and, uh, we, we, we took our significant others with us mm-hmm. and, uh, we're talking about it one evening after, and, you know, First two days, we didn't even get a bite. We hadn't caught a fish. And so your pre- first two days yes, pre-fishing, you hadn't caught, hadn't caught a fish. So uh, one of them suggests, hey, why don't you use what you use in Kansas? You guys, you did really good doing that. So I said, well, you know, maybe that's a good idea. Yeah, it, it's, and it, we found one spot that was 55 miles from the launch. Um, dude. That, and it was a stretch you, of. You found it? Yeah. And, and it was just a, a rock ridge. And, you know, all these other guys are fishing 40, 50 feet deep, and this is 12 feet deep. And it was just a rock ridge. And So is it basically out in the middle? You, you can't see ground? You can't no, see we, we could see the land. We were still only six or seven miles offshore at this point. Okay. Um, and, you know, we we found this and fished the technique that we fish here in Kansas. And uh we caught two fish in about 10 minutes and said, okay, well, this is, you know, we're, we're down to the last hour of pre-fish before we have to go to the meeting. So you do realize what you just did right now, don't you? You just admitted that your significant others. She was right. They were both right. On, okay. And, and neither one of them have any fishing experience <laughs> at all. If either one of them listen to this, they're going to, uh, I'm going to hear about it. Yep. You will. Hmm. And, uh, so the first day of the tournament, we make the 55 mile run. Um, we made it hour and a half going down. It was, the lake was dead calm. Uh-huh. Um, we caught, I don't know, seven or eight fish probably. And we kept our five biggest, made it back to weigh in. So we had about four hours of run time the first day. So it took you four hours to get there. Is that what you're talking four about? Four hours, two hours each way was about right. Okay. Was. Um, yeah. The okay. four hours total about. run time, eight hours to fish, and we had four hours of run time. So you used you used basically half your time getting to where mm-hmm. you need to go. Okay. And uh, so you were all in. We were all in. Uh, and I don't remember what position we were in after the first day, thirty fifth or something. Uh, how many teams? Four hundred and twenty something. And so we go out the second day, and it's rough. Rough by their standards. The wind's blowing five miles an hour. Huh. And I laugh because right now I think today we're like 55, 15 <laughs> to 30. I think the forecast is 15 to 30 with gusts of, of yeah. 45, but it's really like gust of 65 outside mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. And, and by all means, that was windy up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could run about 15 miles an hour. Yeah. Cause the body of water is so big. It's like it, being on the ocean. Yeah. I mean, in a 20 foot boat, we would go down in the bottom of the swells and you couldn't see anything. All I seen was water. And is it, that's butt puckery. Yes. 
Yes, it was. And uh, it was not a smooth ride by no means. Uh, so I think we had about an hour and a half to fish the second day. We, we made one pass th- through our spot. You know, and the waves, are they're drifting you over one mile an hour. So we're, we're drift fishing. Uh, in, and we go one pass through there and we caught, I think, three or four. And so we, we go up just a couple hundred yards and float it again. And we caught our fifth fish and we didn't even, we didn't even measure them. We didn't weigh them. We, we just knew we could, as soon as we caught five fish, we have to head back because, uh, we may, may or may not make it in time. Mm -hmm. And we got back with 10 or 12 minutes to spare. Uh, we fished, I don't, I I don't think we fished an hour total the second day. (laughs) And there was guys that were going a lot further than we were going. But they had different boats. They, they had different boats. That. They had different boats that were a lot bigger, um, you know, 400 horse outboards that. No, I got they, a buddy that fishes in that and he's done real well. I think he's won it once. And, uh, yeah, they, they have air cushion seats, mm-hmm. uh, you know, air ride seats so they can run three times as fast in that rough water as we could. And I, I couldn't walk when I got off the boat. It was so rough. No, I can't even imagine. And, um, so we weighed in and, uh, top 25 made the all American deal. If you get a big championship ring, uh, the whole deal and you get to fish the third day. And I think first prize was like a hundred thousand dollars in a new boat or it, it was a mm-hmm. big prize. And, uh, we finished 26th by two ounces. God. And you talk about a sickening feeling. I would have rather fished, finished 150th. And, you know, we had no experience. We, we I mean, we. So what were you guys just saying? Or like we're around there. What were they saying? Like, what did they, did, I mean, did anybody talk to you or anybody just, hear your story? You know, or? No. I mean, this is such a huge event. I mean, right. Huge, huge event. It, it took two hours to get all the boats launched. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that was the, the coolest thing in the world, but it was a sickening feeling to finish two ounces. I can only imagine. But I mean, you know, to put that into perspective, this, you know, finishing 26th out of that many on a completely foreign, I mean, it's not even. So oh, no, it's like being to, on a different planet from what we're used yeah, to here. Yeah. That's just crazy. That's absolutely insane to, to, I knew you'd finish it, but I know I'd never heard the whole story. Yeah. And, uh, that that's been the extent of my tournament fishing. I've, I, uh, th- that, that <laughs> common thread. With, <laughs> well, that was, you know, the, I was in the lead for, you know, going into the third day, but then I got sick and I was, you know, yeah. finish on top. Well, that was, it was a fun experience. I, yeah. I would go back and do that again in a heartbeat and not fish in the tournament. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't like the pressure. Well, not necessarily the pressure. I don't mind that at all. I don't like the fact of no matter what, you have to go. Whether the wind's blowing hard or it's raining mm-hmm. or it's cold, you have to fish. Yeah. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of a fair weather guy anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, I would have been all for it. You know, hunting, I want the nasty conditions and, you know, fishing, it wouldn't have bothered me, but mm-hmm. now pretty fair weather now. Well, earlier you, you alluded to your age and, as you get older, I can tell you that <laughs> that becomes more and more. You're like, you know, that that wind's going to be a little bit much, yep. and you know, it's uh, not quite as enjoyable mm-hmm. as what it, what it was. And yep. so, if you had a if you have a a favorite outdoor activity, what is? I mean, you only could do one thing. If I could only do one thing forever, it'd be duck hunting, not geese, ducks. 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 I, you know. Particular, particular species? Nope, just ducks. Any duck. Ducks are a lot easier to kill than geese. Um, I, you know, I used to have ungodly amount of goose decoys and we mm-hmm. chased them all over the place and set up huge spreads with huge, you know, huge groups of guys, eight, 10, 12 guys. And, um, uh, we did really good, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. And, the more the more I've done it, the more the, the less it's about the you know 
how many did your group kill? It's more about uh, did we have fun and enjoying time with I'm s- with with your buddies. I'm so glad you said that because that's been something we've talked about quite a little bit on the podcast. You know, since we started, is is that it's not it's not necessarily the actual shooting of the animal. No, not anymore. It's the yeah, I guess that's true. There is a there was a time where there was there was a time, you know, that that's that was the bottom line, you know, in my early twenties. That's yeah. That I, I was out there, we were out there to make a pile. Yeah, I and like and you say that and what immediately popped into my mind was thinking, um, jumping ponds, you know, climbing, mm-hmm. you know, crawling over the top of the dam. Yep. I I can't even imagine a scenario where I would do that today. Oh, and no. it's nothing against. I mean, that's just no. part of. No, if you want to do it, that's great. Right, but that's, I'm not going to do it. I right. don't. You know, I enjoy the the part. I enjoy is the time spent with friends and you know the getting the birds to decoy. Yeah. You know, we don't we don't pass shoot at anything. We don't. You know, we're we're there for the sport of it. Yeah, and the 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 other thing about it is is the memory. <laughs> that mm-hmm. you're creating yep. and you know we've talked about before on here is like you know i know you you're not uh, you, uh, deer hunting is something you do but it's not your favorite i, we've talked I about. take i take the girls in my household deer hunting right um but we've talked about with with that like for me and and, and a lot of guys are this way that <clears throat> it's not necessarily just the you know the shooting of the animal and taking the picture it's the trail cam picks it's Mm -hmm. the putting in the food plot if you do that hanging the tree stand it's you know you get that trail cam pick and you're like dude this is you know you know whatever or Mm -hmm. i know just recently i saw on your social media pages you you um post a picture of turkeys yep and your daughter was she hadn't shot a turkey she had not shot a turkey and i'd been a long time since i'd turkey hunted probably five six years seven years maybe yeah and I, i was a diehard turkey hunter for a long time but so why did you get out of it? Fishing. That was, you know, when I started my fishing guide business, yeah, I guess prime time funny. Prime time is during turkey season. So yeah. uh, I just quit doing it. And uh, we reached, end of December, we bought, we bought a piece of property, bought our first farm um, over on the Arkansas River. Mm-hmm. And that's been a whole adventure in itself. In, in Kansas, the, that river is called the Arkansas River, Dylan. Yes, it's the Arkansas. It's not the Arkansas yep. River. Not until you get to the Oklahoma state line. Yeah, then you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's still, he's still, I'm surprised he's not going to jump up on the table and take his shirt off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you bought, bought a piece of property over yep. there. And it's been very rewarding, you know seeing the work that you've put in and the success that's come from it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we've shot quite a few at the end of the season, we've shot quite a few ducks on it mm-hmm. and uh, we've spent a ton of time working on that, improving it for next year. And uh, we had turkeys uh, start in early spring. I thought, Hey, let's see if there's turkeys, put a trail camera out there. And you had turkeys. We had lots of turkeys to my surprise. So, mm-hmm. um, Took her out during the youth season, um, and dad still had it. Yep, yep. The uh, luckily for her, the the first morning we went, we sat for three hours. Never heard a bird. Never saw a bird. Nothing. So she she did kind of learn that turkey hunting's not easy. Uh, we went the next day and <clears throat> excuse me, uh, set up. As soon as I got the decoy stake in the ground. I heard him gobble, you know, it was mid afternoon, heard mm-hmm. him gobble 50 yards away Ooh. right over the hill. And within five minutes of getting there, we were packed up and headed home. That's awesome. And uh, that's almost too quick to be honest. Oh yeah. It wasn't even, if that would have been her first experience turkey hunting, she would have thought that was the way it was Shoot mm-hmm. me forever. Yeah. It's cool how that kind of happens mm-hmm. like that. You know, sometimes it, you know, it takes more than, you know, you don't, we don't know. You know, mm-hmm. the, the the man upstairs is the one that's, you know, yep. calling the shots. But, you know, you you go. I love turkey hunting, and I think it's one of the best things to, to um, 
take people out first time, you know, mm-hmm. hunters and stuff for, because I think it's, there's the, I don't know, for me, I just love that it's the interactive, that it, you know, that it, you've got yeah. that Tom that's just like, oh, yeah. thundering and he's, yep. especially if he's jacked. Yep. Same sort of deal with the uh, waterfowl hunting. I'm not going to go, you know, ambush a, ambush a flock of turkeys on the, on a fence line and, right. and shoot one. But if you call him in and puts on a show for you, of course I'm going to shoot one. You know, that's, that's yeah. the, that's the part of it that I enjoy. And the she, memory. Yep. And she got the most awesome experience. You know, he come in there, come out of the, stepped out into the field edge and, you know. Jellyhead just. Oh mad. yeah. Yep. He was looking for a fight and. Oh, uh, kicking sand. Yep. And come and just come on a string right to the decoy and. Uh, she sealed the deal. She sealed the deal. I, 35 yards with that, 410 with the with the TSS shot. That is very impressive stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're not shooting a, a turkey, shooting TSS shot for at turkeys, you need to be because that is unbelievable. We're getting ready to use it. We're taking out um, Jessica, my daughter, and that's what I've got her set up with. Absolutely. I, I mean, worth every penny. Yeah, I think we're going to go out on Saturday and see if we can't get into one. We'll have to see. I'm yeah. kind of excited. I hope she, I hope she gets one. I know, I'm 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 pretty stoked. And it's so that's you know that's you know what we the, it's the memories. Oh, and absolutely. The, yeah, it's the it's not just the the hunt itself. The hunt is a big part of it, but it's mm-hmm. the memories and being able to reflect and go back on it. And now you know we got these phones and you can just yep. you can it's it's a double edged sword. It's good and bad. You it know, is good can, and bad. You can get all the memories, you know, uh, right there. They're recorded. They're easy. They're easy to retrieve and fetch. Um, but then you can also get lost in them, and then mm-hmm. nobody goes out and hunts and cre- actually yep. creates. Memories. Well, that you know, d- when I when I was deer hunting quite frequently, uh, trail cameras were popular but and you know they just become digital trail, trail cameras and mm-hmm. you still had to go pull the card and mm-hmm. do all that but today's technology where it sends a picture to your phone that's uh you know I, I know several guys they don't go hunting until they they see a deer on camera that they want to shoot and you know if that's what you enjoy that, that's great but to me that takes some of the thrill of it out mm-hmm. uh but you know that's that's the that's the world we live in. So yeah. same way with the fishing. You know the live sonar technology has taken a lot of the fishing part of it out. Mm-hmm. There's there's no guesswork anymore. It's you know and when I have clients, I, I it might take me ten minutes to find the fish, or it might take me an hour. But as soon as you drop a bait down, you're going to get a bite. Um, you know, I I still do enjoy just going fishing without that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the river fishing, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, and, the, and you know, along the lines of the trail camera and all the other things, the tools that are out there, I mean, they're just that. They're still a tool. At the end of the mm-hmm. day, you still got to finish yep. the deal. But as you're saying, you know, when we get a when we get a piece of property or, you know, there's times where guys will get a piece of property that they haven't been on to hunt or anything before. And what I find funny is, is that um, Sometimes I'll go, you know, I'll get asked to go, you know, hey, we got this new piece of property. You want to go, you know, look at it. And you know how to, I mean, mm-hmm. when somebody gets a new piece of property, your close friends or people that you trust and know aren't going to, you know, going to gonna either try and sneak in there or whatever, but they'll take you. But um, coming from where, you know, back in my day, we didn't have anything like Onyx or oh, yeah. any of that stuff. And I remember... um we didn't have drones. We didn't have none of that. Yep. And I can vividly remember I was probably 14. I mean, and I was thinking, well, how can I get to see everything? You know what I mean? Like I'm walking through here, but yet I can't quite get it all figured out. This mm-hmm. is such big country in this area that I was hunting. And I was like, well, I saw an airplane. I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to get somebody to fly me over this. Yep. And so then from now on for the next three or four or five years, I would, you know, top topography maps and stuff, but around here, they're not that, they, they don't. It's too flat. Yeah, it's too flat. <laughs> There's no, I mean, we have 15 foot of elevation change, yeah. you know, and it's not big, but so I would pay somebody to take me, um, mm-hmm. you know, up an airplane. And then that's where you could see the pinch points. And that's where, so today, like when we get a new piece of property to hunt, or if I'm looking at something or, you know, somebody tells me, you know, like, you know, sends me a piece of property that they're hunting and, you know. We're talking about, you know, where, where are you going to put a stand or what do you think or whatever? And you can scan into it with on X. Like 
that being able to find a pinch point or where you know where I'm a place to stand, it's so it's so interesting to me mm-hmm. that these I don't, I don't want to talk like these new hunters or whatever, but how many hunters just you know they see a trail or well, I don't I don't I don't ever, I don't even really know where where why they come up with putting up where they're going to put the tree stand or what they come up with, but I mean to me hunting a pinch point or hunting a, a natural area where the deer or where the game and it's not going to just be in that in that case it's not going to be just the deer. It's going to be all animals mm-hmm. are going to have that pinch point. Yep. And so that, that outdoorsman uh, type of stuff, you know, that's kind of, I can totally relate to what you're saying. That's, it's really cool. Yep. And you know, I've, I've given people close friends, exact waypoints of spots to fish on the lake say, Hey, go to this spot, you know, anchor up at the, on this side of the rock pile, cast this lure and they still don't catch any fish. So just, just because you put somebody in the right spot doesn't mean, you know, and that's what that's what people were paying me to do was, you know, not all the not all those spots are good all the time. And I knew, knew what to look for and knew, uh, you know, that that's why I was getting paid to do so, because, you know, all that changes day to day. And that's the thousands of hours I'd spent doing that sort of stuff is, you know, I, I've learned and learned that in waterfowl hunting, too, you know you know, save your good spots when the conditions are good and go to a mediocre spot when the conditions are bad, you know, no wind or, uh, or dealing with ice or cloud cover or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, and that's where, what kind of separates some, some people from others. And, you know, luckily now I can, I can kind of go when the conditions are right. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a nine to five job, but the the weekend guy that doesn't matter what the weather is, they're off Saturday and Sunday, they're going to go. There's nothing wrong with that, but, uh, that, and that's the way most people are. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, people would book a trip and say, Hey, we want to go while well, the wind's blowing 25 mile an hour. And I, I can't hold the boat still. It, it's not doable. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but there, you know, that's, that's kind of what you have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you had to give one piece of advice on waterfowl hunting to somebody, that you feel like they could walk away from or take that's, you know, generalized, what would, what would that one, one thing be? I mean, if it's, it doesn't matter, decoys, location, calls, calling. If you're not, my one thing would be, well, you can't just narrow it down to one, but if you're not rarely experienced, don't take a duck call. Yeah. Less is more. Mm-hmm. Everybody that's new, they want to blow the duck call. I mean, and I'm probably guilty of it, of overcalling sometimes myself. And, um, some people won't agree with me on this, but go when the wind's blowing out of the South and it's sunny. I would agree with the sunny part. And I don't know about the direction so much, but well, what I've always compared it to is driving into the sun. So the ducks see way better than we do. If you're yeah. driving into the sun, you can't, you can't see anything, but when you're driving away from the sun, you can see really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good. Now I see where you're going with that. So now, the, now I would absolutely and, agree. In the winter time, the sun rises mm-hmm. and the southeast mm-hmm. sets in the southwest. Um, if this, if it's sunny, you know, south wind blowing, they're they're staring right into the sun mm-hmm. when they're coming in. They they won't see you. Mm-hmm. You can get away with so much more. And that's, I mean, I would tell you, I 100 percent agree, and I know it to be true that that. <clears throat> wild animals, not just ducks, but wild animals will use every advantage that they can in that sun, mm-hmm. the, the ability not to be able to see. They can't see into the sun either. Yep. And so if they can, can if they can have that control, they will do that. And I can, Absolutely. Yeah. And I cut my teeth waterfowl hunting on uh, Wellington Lake here, and it's a totally different type of waterfowl hunting. You like. Yep. You, you you use window weights for your <laughs> yep. for your but the guys weights. on the east side of the lake kill more ducks than the guys That's on the exactly west side where of the was, lake. Where I was going, we we had our blind on the east side of the lake, and you could just see those guys on the west side of the lake. And I mean, they literally their faces, their heads look like pumpkins. Yep. If they didn't have, you know, some type of face covering and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the other thing too is is that just all. Uh, there, there's certain species that can see better or, or, you know, have better noses or whatever, but all of them have darn good eyes Mm -hmm. for, I mean, turkeys. And it's not just necessarily eyes, it's movement. It is movement, a hundred percent movement. And that's, you know, 
especially ta- taking my daughter, you know, at that age. Yeah. She, she, she likes to move and I'm, I'm just as bad about it sitting in a deer stand. I, I mean, I'm fidgety. I'm, yeah. I'm go, 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 go. And, uh, I can't just sit there and be still. Right. Uh, but yeah, movement is huge. Yeah. I think, I mean, mo- yeah, it's all of it. I mean, movement, sound, scent, all that, but movement and sound, I think are the two mm-hmm. for sure. Yep. And duck, waterfowl do, they hear better than you think they do. Yeah. Especially on the water. Yep. I mean, stuff carries so far on yep. the water. They so, hear way better than you think they do. And that, you know, if they're up in the air, that, that sound, if you're calling, it echoes off the water and then mm-hmm. they can definitely. Yep. Every, every, almost everybody I've guided over the years, their duck calls, you know, bring their duck calls from Louisiana, Mississippi, wherever. They're so loud. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'll be working a group of ducks coming, you know, they're a hundred yards away and they feel the need to let her rip on that duck call and just bl- blow them right out of the hole. And it's, you know, they don't realize how loud it is. It sounds like a duck call to them, but, mm-hmm. um, my, the duck calls I use are su- super quiet, super soft. And so are your duck calls that you use, are they wood encased or are they it's, acrylic? It's uh, a wood barrel and an acrylic insert. Mm-hmm. So I didn't. Do you just have one call that you use mainly, or do you have? I've got two of the same one. Two of the same, but yep. do you have them tuned differently, or just? Nope, same. You know, they get in case one they, freezes up. Well, or... one gets frozen, or or gets full of spit, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I carry two of the same one, and a, and a whistle is probably the most underused duck call there is. Yeah. Um, Interesting. I've never used a whistle. Yep. No, and you... I would consider myself somebody who's duck hunted a, a, a large amount. A whistle, a, especially for somebody that doesn't know how to call. And I, well, I know, I think I know how to call. I feel pretty. Comfortable. A whistle is, you know, very, very effective. So I have um, two different duck calls that I carry, and one of them is wood, and that's my quiet call, if you will, or my soft call. Mm-hmm. And then I have one that's acrylic, but I use the wood one probably eighty percent of the time. But if I, you know, if I'm feel like I need to get a little bit louder or whatever. And it's still not that loud. So I mean, like I said, I would agree with you on that, but my, my wood one, I've even had guys say, you know, ah, that thing, you can't even hardly hear it. It's like, it's not I'm like, I, I just feel like, yeah. and I've sounds, never heard you sounds, say that. Sounds like a duck. Yeah. I've never heard you say that before, but that's, I would agree with you for sure. It's, it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and limiting the calls. Cause you got to think those ducks have been, you know, they started up in Canada getting shot. Oh, at. Oh man. They're so, and anymore they're, so pressured. Yeah. So pressured. And everywhere you go, I mean, they don't get a rest anymore. Um, you know, from the second they, they're born, they're, they're pursued by something. So, mm-hmm. um, definitely, especially as you get later and later in the season, less is definitely more. Yeah. And I've heard that so many times from so many different people that, you know, are in there and, and, you know, it's, it is, it is tough when you're in there, when you're out hunting, it's like, you know, you you want to have that interactive. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it's a blast to, to blow your duck call and yeah. But you know, less is definitely more. Think of how many times you've been, you know, standing there or outside the blind or something, and nobody's made a noise for ten minutes, and then all of a sudden here comes a flock of ducks and they just come straight yeah, in. They, just, they never circle. They don't do anything. They just come straight in, mm-hmm. and it and it catches everybody by surprise. Well, you're being quiet, not you know. Yeah, the mo- to me the movement is the number one. Mm-hmm. I had a guy who, 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 you know, a mentor of mine, and he was an old timer. This guy could mouth call, I and mean, he was just a cool dude. And uh, I was, you know, young and fidgeting around and moving around in the blind or whatever. And he was telling me, like, you know, damn it, you need to sit still and blah blah. You know, I'm like, we're in the blind, like there's, you know, grass in the way mm-hmm. and everything. Of course, you know, the top's still kind of open or whatever. And, and I'll never forget, he stuck his hand outside the. We had some some coming in. He stuck his hand outside the blind, and you know here they are locked up. I mean they're just they're just cupped. I mean they're coming in, and all he did was just turned his hand over. That was it. Yep. And didn't do it fast. Didn't wave his fingers. Nothing. And gone. So I mean, just were, mm-hmm. yeah. It was just it was yeah. So it movement is for sure, and you know. And that's the that's you know everybody's everybody wants to talk about decoys and decoy spreads and this and that and the other to me that none of that makes a difference 
I mean, look look at ducks on the water. They're never they're never in the same spots. They're never in the same position. And they on the water they move. They're, they're constantly swimming. They never sit still. Do you feel like you can manipulate manipulate where they're going to land to better your opportunity or shot based upon most a lot of the times? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there there is some. You know, there's some rhyme and reason why you know why you set up this way that way. Yeah. But that's give them a spot to land right in front of you. Yeah. And that's all, you know, that's the, the, your decoy spread is probably the least important. So whenever you, I mean, we've all had it happen. If you've been out hunting more than one time for waterfowl, the, you, something's not right. Like they're, they didn't come in right or whatever. And 90% of the time they're seeing you. That's what you think. Uh, At I would, least I would, 90, maybe more than that. You're, you, you know, your, your decoy spreads the, the, always the least of my worries. It's always, how well are you hidden? Yeah. And, um, you know, the group of guys I hunt with, um, and I'm guilty of it too, cause we're, you know, we're pretty fair weather. Now we, we don't put as much effort into it as we would if, you know, if I was guiding a group of clients, you know, I don't put as much effort into it as I probably should a lot of times, but you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. We'll go tomorrow, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we, you know, still do spend, a lot of time staying hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, that's by far the most important part. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with you on that for sure. So, well, man, I greatly appreciate it. Thanks for coming on here. We're yeah. going to wrap it up, but it's been a blast. It doesn't seem like we've been sitting here for <laughs> I over, know. over an hour and we could continue to do it. And and I'm sure we'll do it again sometime in the future. But yep. if, uh, yep. if uh, <clears throat> you ever want to come back on and figure out you got something else you need to talk about, Oh, don't hesitate. I could probably talk for a week. Yeah. It's always fun for sure. <laughs> but Yep. And that's how, you know, people that aren't that experienced, that's how they learn. If, you know, watch this. You can, you know, I and I still watch videos and listen to stuff and read articles. And I'm, I mean, I'm as experienced as I am, I, I learn something new all the time. Do you ever read or, or listen, listen or watch any of those and go, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do that? Or you, you know, yeah, a, a some, quote unquote yeah. pro says something. Yeah. I've, I've seen that before. I'm like, yep. I just do not agree yep. with that. Uh, I've taken many outdoor, you know, outdoor figures out, you know, no, you know, fairly well known people in the outdoor industry, and you're like, how how long you been doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, which you, you know, and some of the um, I took Jim Zumbo fishing. I remember you telling me about that. Uh, shoot, he's in his 80s. He was in his mm -hmm. 80s three or four years ago. I don't know how old he is. Very, very knowledgeable guy. Mm -hmm. Old school writer, you know, and he got his experience from doing it. He didn't get his experience by reading other people's articles mm -hmm. and listening to their stuff and taking what they said and, and, and using that. He was just a wealth of knowledge yeah. from hunting mule deer, elk, you name it, everything. Have you, ever, have you ever hunted mule deer? Nope. Do you have any desire to go out west? Nope. I am not a big game hunter. Do you have no desire? No desire. Not? Africa? Nope. I, you wouldn't, you know. So when I was your age, here I, when I was your age, I was walking <laughs> on the hill, um, I had zero desire to go to Africa. None. And all of a sudden, like in the last three or four years, it's kind of come on. I'm like, I don't know. Like I kind of want to go. Yeah. I don't know why. The, what I would like to do, I'd like to go to Argentina or, or Mexico. On dove hunt. Dove hunt or, or duck hunt yeah. combo. What about uh, turkey hunt? Do you have any desire to shoot a Grand Slam? Nope. Let me guess, you've already done it? Nope. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, really, I did that, nope. I did when, that when, twice when, in the in the 90s, and I've done it twice in the you know early 2000s. I'm working on my fourth one this year. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, you know, uh, I, I'm pretty much strictly a, a wing shooter i mean that's what i i'll, I'll go anywhere you want to go to shoot birds but big game turkeys so what about going like to um over into europe or over in like uh like down to new zealand and shooting waterfowl down there i would do that i, I do i want to go on a sea duck hunt that's what yeah sea duck uh, uh like a, you uh, know the maryland Harlequin Maine. and yeah i want to go do that i would Something I want to do. I wanted to go to the Great Salt Lake, uh, hunt teal at the Great Salt Lake. This they have cinnamon teal out there mm -hmm. and blue. They have all three species. Is it all three? Yep. Uh, I shot a cinnamon when I was in Arizona. 
that was pretty cool. I mean, I, I mean, we've got them occasionally around here, but we fishing on the river the other day. We seen one cinnamon. Mm-hmm. First yeah. one I've ever seen in person. In this yeah, thing. I've. I've, I don't know that I've ever seen one here. Maybe I, I feel like I have seen one here, but, um, but no, I have not ever shot one here, but no. you know, I shot one in uh, Arizona. That was really cool. And it was kind of cool out there that, you know, again, I'm showing my age, but we were, we were, um, you always read about, you know, top 10 places to hunt ducks or whatever. And they always talk about something out, you know, because they have to, it's geographic, you know, the, the audience is like all mm-hmm. these different areas. And of course I was young. And so there was this, you know, you had to hunt, I don't remember what it was, something on the, on the Colorado river preserve or something. And I went and hunted it and, and don't get me wrong. It was really good, but it was nothing like back here, nothing, yeah. but the amount of pintails that they had out would there would make you sick. Oh, well, there, we, we had a, a, a wad of like 60 come in one time and there was one greenhead in there. And these guys, of course, are just slobbering over the greenhead. And I'm like, I give it, I give it. Yeah. I don't care about that green yet, dude. I want to shoot a spray. Yep. So it's just funny how, you know, you get oh, different yeah. areas and what about, have you ever timber hunted? Yes. You have timber yep. hunted. Yep. I've never done that. That yep. is something I want to do. You know, and we, we used to hunt a small river. Mm-hmm. I mean, like a Creek. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a river, but you know, 20 feet wide and, and you got, talk about it. and you got, it, it was unbelievable. And uh, it's completely different shooting. Oh yeah. And it would come, they, they come, you know, straight down through the trees, they got to get into that Creek. And once they get in, there's no getting out. And that, <laughs> that was, to me, that was way better than hunting in the green timber. And yeah. they, I mean, and people would come from, you know, the South, you know, Arkansas, Louisiana that hunt in the timber. And they, they, everybody said that was the coolest thing ever seeing those, you know, you'd sometimes you'd get three or 400 at a time that would come into that Creek and, or that river. And, you know, we've never shoot at those groups. We'd shoot at fours and yeah. fives because, you know, we were hunting that half mile stretch of river four days a week. So. Right. Yeah. I've, I've had times and seasons and places like that where you're just like, you don't want to shoot all the, the, the big mm-hmm. rods. And so, yep. yeah, yeah, that's so cool. But, well, man, I greatly appreciate it. Um, for all of our listeners out there, um, if you, you know, if you like the, the podcast or anything, we really would appreciate it if you go and like, and subscribe and uh, follow us on all of our social media pages that sure helps us out. Um, you know, powder and string outfitters, um, we're on YouTube, social media uh, pages. We're on, uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And, uh, so we greatly appreciate it. And, uh, until next time, powder and string outfitters, we're your hometown shop. Mm-hmm.